Okay, thank you, Mohamed, for the introduction and also for the invitation. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here and uh, to present our uh, work to you. And um, the, the title of my talk is pretty long. Maybe you don't even need an abstract if you have a title like that. Uh, it's non-reciprocal quantum optical devices based on chiral interaction with confined light and spin polarized atoms. And that's also really like the uh, content of the talk. And maybe I should start by a short disclaimer about the word chiral here because there's a, a high probability that uh, your idea of what chiral means is different from what I mean. So I should say that chiral in the context of this talk is synonymous for propagation direction dependent. So we, we are uh, talking about uh, interaction of uh, light and quantum emitters, which depends on the direction of propagation forwards or backwards uh, of light. Okay? And um, the, the uh, origin of this chiral interaction comes from the transverse confinement of light. And uh, in conjunction with spin polarized atoms, we can then also realize components which are non-reciprocal. Okay? And maybe I uh, first say a few words about what non-reciprocal means in the uh, context of, of optics. Uh, non-reciprocal is a non-reciprocal element is an element which treats light differently when it propagates through the medium, uh, depending on whether it propagates from left to right or right to left. And that can be the phase or the amplitude of transmission that is then different for the two propagation directions. And the prime example of such a non-reciprocal uh, element is a Faraday rotator. So uh, a Faraday rotator uh, actually rotates the plane of linear polarization when the light propagates through a medium, which is a magneto-optic crystal, but it can also be, for example, alkali vapor, as demonstrated by Charles Adams recently. And uh, if you apply a magnetic field to this uh, medium here, uh, along the direction of propagation of the light, then the rotation of the polarization plane is about this uh, uh, direction of the magnetic field, meaning that at the exit of my crystal, the field, uh, the plane of polarization has an angle beta with respect to the input polarization. And now if you send the light backwards with this, with this as the input polarization, however, you don't get to the input polarization, but you will come out with an angle two beta. So the rotation is always in the same direction, which is set by the direction of the magnetic field. And um, this angle, this rotation angle beta here is uh, proportional to the length of my medium and it is proportional to the magnetic field strength and the proportionality constant is this constant V here, it's the Verde constant, uh, depends on the wavelength and is a material constant that is given by my magneto-optical crystal or by the alkali uh, vapor. And now, having such a Faraday rotator at hand, it is possible to realize, for example, an optical isolator. Uh, for that purpose, we just have to put a polarization filter on this side of the crystal and a polarization filter on this side of the crystal and arrange the angle beta here to be 45 degrees. In that case, the light that propagates from left to right will just go through the filter, which is aligned with this uh, the 45 degree direction, but if I send the light back, uh, it will be rotated by another 45 degrees. And then that means that the light that is injected, say, into port one here goes through to port two, but if I send the light backwards from port two, it will be blocked by the polarization filter here. So this is like a diet, optical diet for light. And um, you can also turn this into a more, into a four port device, which would then be called optical circulator by replacing the polarization filters here by polarization beam splitters. In this case, rather than just being dissipated here, my light would be reflected uh, out of another port, okay? So when I send now light into port two, 
It will be reflected here, comes out of port three. If I send the light into port three, it comes out of port four. If I send light into port four, it will come out of port one. So one to two to three to four to one is the routing scheme of an optical circulator. And these optical circulators are very important components uh, for optical communication and signal uh, processing. They allow you to add, for example, a signal onto another signal or uh, take away uh, one, one channel from uh, uh, an existing channel. And now this is here a bulk optical isolator that you can buy just at Torlabs, for example. And typically, the length of the crystal in these isolators is on the order of a centimeter. And the magnetic field that I apply here uh, is actually uh, limited by the field strengths given by permanent magnets that are used for this purpose on the order of a Tesla. Now, if I now want to reach this 45 degree angle with these, this length and this field strength, then I know that I need a Verde constant of 80 radians per Tesla and meter. And this is perfectly accessible for all wavelengths that you can think of. And so you can just buy these from the shelf. However, if we now wanted to miniaturize such an optical isolator, say reduce the length by a factor of 100, then we would still be limited in field strength by the field strength of my permanent magnets to a Tesla, which means that I would need a 100 times larger of a day constant of, say, 8,000 radians per Tesla and meter. And it turns out that such a high of day constant is not available for all wavelengths. So there are just wavelength ranges in which you do not find this high of day constant. And in other wavelength ranges where you find materials that reach this high the day constant. Uh, the problem is that uh, it also comes with a high absorption. So the losses are high. Okay, so that means that when I make a shorter isolator, I invariably get higher losses, which can be a problem. Or I don't even find an isolator that is sh short and small. And that already Gives, one, gives you one reason why it is difficult to realize integrated optical isolators and circulators, because it's just hard to find the right material um, that, that still gives me a high transmission uh, while yielding a high day constant. Uh, there's another reason why it's hard to find uh, non-reciprocal components and in integrated photonics, while everything else you can think of is available. Um, so first of all, uh, as I said, we, we cannot easily miniaturize, but secondly also the waveguides that you have in integrated photonics are typically birefringent, okay? So that means that you cannot simply rotate the polarization, the linear polarization of my light uh, along the, or around the axis or the direction of propagation because of the birefringence of the waveguides. And this, is, it's, this sounds like a technical issue, but we, when you really want to then have a r smooth rotation, you have to tune the thickness of the waveguides on the atomic scale, okay? And once you have it really perfectly non-birefringent, the temperature changes by a tenth of a degree and it's birefringent again. Okay, so this is actually the reason why even now a days after more than 40 years of research, non-reciprocal devices in integrated optics are not commercially available. And those, there is a lot of research, but, uh, and, and the typical devices that are, have been realized look, look like that. I say a few words about that. But it turns out that all these demonstrations up to our work two years ago fail to combine a high isolation with a low uh, forward loss or high forward uh, transmission. Okay. And, and the components that have been realized actually rely on surface waveguides and magnetic films on top of the waveguides. And interestingly, in these devices, be it a Marzenda interferometer here or some uh, ring resonator coupled to a waveguide here, the magnetic field that I apply is not along the direction of propagation, but it is orthogonal to the direction of propagation. And now you could say, how is it possible that a field that is orthogonal to the direction of propagation tells me in which direction the light is allowed to propagate or not, right? This is 
may be surprising. And that has to do with the so-called spin momentum locking of light that occurs in the evanescent field of these waveguides. And uh, to understand this effect of spin momentum locking of light, it's probably easiest to consider the case of a total internal reflection at a simple dielectric interface in the case of P polarization, where P polarization means the electric field oscillates in the plane of the screen here, okay? So in this case, if I have total internal reflection at the surface, I have an evanescent field above uh, my, my interface here, and this evanescent field, for symmetry reasons, can only have two field components. Uh, if I superpose this and the outgoing wave, I certainly don't have anything that is normal to the screen. So I will have both uh, what I call transverse component and a longitudinal component. Okay, so this is the amplitude. And what I know also is that the amplitude for invanescent fields will decay exponentially when I move away from the surface. So this is given by this e to the minus beta x here, where beta is the decay constant of the field or the inverse decay length of my field here. And it is a surface wave that propagates along z. So this is why I have this phase factor e to the ikz here, okay? And if I now want to learn about the relation between these two components, so their magnitude and relative phase, then I need to ask Maxwell's equations. I need to, this, this field needs to fulfill Maxwell's equations, and actually the only part of Maxwell's equations that I have to consult for that purpose is Gauss' law. The divergence of this E field here in this region of space has to vanish, okay? And if I apply Gauss' law to this field that I just wrote down, then I immediately find that the uh, transverse, and long, the transverse and longitudinal components are proportional to each other, okay? And the proportionality constant is given by the ratio of the decay constant of the amplitude from the uh, surface and the wave number of the surface wave propagating along the surface, okay? So interestingly, this ratio for a dielectric interface for a glass prism and grazing incidence is on the order of one. So both beta and k are about two pi over lambda, where lambda is the optical wavelength of the light, okay? And <clears throat> this, uh, there's another very important, so, so this means that these two components, their magnitude is almost the same, okay? The longitudinal component is as large as the transverse component. And now there's another very important part of this equation, which is this phase factor minus i. This means that the longitudinal component and transverse components oscillate in phase quadrature, 90 degrees out of phase with respect to each other. And this means that the superposition of these two components will then give rise to elliptical, or for simplicity, let us talk about circular polarization. Okay, circular because these two components are almost the same. And um, that means that we have circular polarization, but the circular polarization is very different from the circular polarization of a paraxial light field like a laser beam. If you take a circularly polarized laser beam, then the electric field behaves like the propeller of an airplane. So the field propagates in this direction and the E field turns in a plane that is normal to the direction of propagation. Here, the E field vector rotates in a plane that contains the direction of propagation. So the E field behaves like the rotor of a helicopter. The field goes in this direction, uh, the, the light propagates in this direction, and the E field turns like this, okay? Now, you can quantify this polarization by introducing a so-called ellipticity vector, um, which is a vector which is normal to the plane of polarization and its length uh, indicates the degree of circularity. So if it's circular polarization, it's unit length. If it's linear polarization, the ellipticity vector has zero length. And it's the op opposite circular polarization, it would point into the board, okay? And it turns out that this ellipticity vector is exactly the same quantity as the spin of the light field. Where here, spin of the light field 
refers not to a quantum quantity, but it's actually a classical electrodynamic quantity. It corresponds to the intrinsic angular momentum carried by the light field. So that means that if I put an uh, absorbing particle here at that position, and it interacts with the light and absorbs photon from this light field, it will start spinning about an axis which is normal to the direction of propagation. Okay, so that is the effect of this internal uh, intrinsic angular angular momentum. Okay, and um, now this so-called transverse uh, spin of light has important consequences, in particular when it comes to the reversal of the direction of propagation. Because if I now consider, rather than sending the light from the left to the right and a surface wave propagating in this direction, if I consider the opposite direction of propagation, so I take e to the ikz, this phase vector to be e to the minus ikz, uh, then the longitudinal component here flips signs. So before it was minus i times ex, now it is plus i times ex, which means that um, the sense of circulation of the E field flips sign. So it's very easy to understand. It's just like running the movie backwards. So when the wave propagates in this direction, the E field turns counterclockwise. When the wave propagates from right to left, then accordingly the field has to turn clockwise. So this means that the um, spin, the transverse component of the spin of light flips sign with the direction of propagation. And this effect is referred to as spin momentum locking of light. So the spin and the linear momentum of the light are no longer independent quantities, but they are one-to-one -one locked. This transverse spin flips sign when I reverse the direction of propagation, okay? Uh, interestingly, this phenomenon is not, and just to like uh, maybe highlight a bit more the general uh, statement, this is not limited to surface waves only in the optical. Uh, exactly the same thing happens for water waves. So just a small uh, uh, excursion uh, to water waves. So actually when you look at a surface wave on water, then the speed of the surface wave is much, much slower than the bulk speed of sound in the, in the water, which means that the amplitude has to decay exponentially when you move away from the surface. Okay, and now uh, if I have an amplitude that diminishes with distance from the surface, like for the evanescent field before, um, and I have, in this case for water, the continuity equation for an incompressible liquid, okay, so where the divergence of the velocity field of the water has to vanish. So this is true for an incompressible liquid, okay, then this means that the water moves in more or less circular orbits, okay. And that, that is what you, that is what we have here in this cartoon. And that means when the water wave now runs from left to right, then the flow of water locally is clockwise. And now if I reverse the direction of propagation, the sense of circulation also has to flip. So when the, now when the wave runs from right to left, it, the water runs counterclockwise. So this is the same kind of spin momentum uh, locking of light in, in water waves. And yes. I understand that when you analyze these water waves in more detail, you find that there's a little bit of a drift as well, called mm -hmm. Stokes drift. Uh -huh. So does that have any effect on this, uh, this whole... Uh, so uh, but does, does that, I th I mean, can, can it be that this occurs when the water wave feels the ground? I think that that is what happens. So you start to have, because in, in the infinitely deep ocean, I think you don't have transport of matter for water waves and you only get transport on the beach yeah. where the water wave starts to feel the ground. Is, is, and I, well, I don't, you know, <laughs> what do I know about water waves? <laughs> but my recollection is that there are two different solutions, whether you're deep or not. Yes. And, uh, and of course, even when you're not deep doesn't mean you're breaking. Mm -hmm. So it's not like the wave breaking on that. But I think both of them lead to drift. But okay. anyway, maybe we'll talk about it later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but I should say that for the optical case, you have a strictly exponential decay of the electric field intensity. And then if you analyze the 
circulation of the E field. It is in the, I mean, in the case of a dielectric interface, it will be independent of the distance from the interface. It's the same polarization because the exponential always has the same relative change per unit length. And so there is strictly the same polarization when you move away from the, from the surface. And in any case, the angular momentum is always strictly perpendicular to the direction of propagation. Uh huh. So yes. Even when it's not circular. It's yes. Still... Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, maybe I didn't realize, but so what happened to the S polars? So it shines light mm -hmm. polarizations in the interface plane. Yes. Or normal to it, right? Yes. So if it was sort of in the plane, what would this affect still? So uh, what I. What I um, gave here as an introduction to spin momentum locking of light indeed only refers to P polarization. And then you get the spin momentum uh, locking. If you have S polarization, then the polarization of my evanescent wave will be purely linear. For, for symmetry reasons, you see that there cannot be, in that case, you, you do not get longitudinal components, no transverse components. So that means that if I have S polarization, then my evanescent field is S polarized, and then there is no transverse spin. And then the, if I reverse the direction of propagation, the polarization state remains unchanged, okay? And that is important if, when we look at now at the uh, uh, polarization properties around nanofibers where both S and P polarization occur, depending on where, if I have a cylindrical waveguide, then you know, I have regions where it's to a good approximation P polarized reflection, and at other positions in my cylindrical waveguide, I have S polarized reflection. And then I do have more or less transverse spin of light as a function of position around the fiber. Okay, so um, with the, uh, 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 so now having this spin momentum locking uh, of light at hand, you can actually realize uh, that propagation direction dependent coupling of light and matter if, because the coupling between light and matter in general depends on the angular momentum of the light and that angular momentum changes. So that means that in, a, in addition to the case where I have direction, propagation direction depend, independent couplings, so say I take a, now an atom and I couple it to a translation invariant, way, to the evanescent field around a translation invariant cylindrical waveguide here, then uh, the typical or standard case would be that I have the same amount of light going to the left and to the right. But uh, owing to the spin momentum locking of light, I can realize, and we did realize uh, in 2014, a situation where my atom emits more light to the right and less light, uh, more light to the left and less light to the right. And we can actually flip that direction by flipping the polarization of the emitted light and tell the atom and now send your light to the right rather than uh, to the left. And uh, I should also stress that this is not limited to this experimental uh, system only. It invariably, spin, spin momentum locking of light occurs invariably when I have transverse confinement of light. It has to do with the derivatives of the field in the transverse uh, direction. And so similar effects have been observed in, in many groups by now. So uh, check, out, check out their work, both with quantum and classical uh, emitters, okay? So, um, now, with that, I come to the overview of the rest of the talk. I will first present in detail the guided modes and optical nanofibers and, and talk about this uh, spin momentum locking of light once more. And I will then show you that um, this can actually be used for something useful, which is actually a non-reciprocal element, an optical diet, which is controlled by the spin of the atoms coupled to this waveguide. And I will also show you that we can uh, realize the same thing with a single atom which is coupled uh, to a whispering gallery remote resonator, then realizing an optical circulator. So the um, intensity distribution of the guided mode in such an optical nanofiber, which is our experimental platform, it's a dielect glass fiber with a diameter uh, smaller than the wavelength of the guided light as indicated here. So this is sketched for a field with where the transverse components of the field are quasi-linearly polarized along the direction of this green arrow here. And in this case for a fiber which has a wave diameter which is about half the optical wavelength, uh, we have about half of the optical power surrounding the fiber in the form of an evanescent wave. And 
uh, you see that here I have a prime situation where, I sh where spin momentum locking of light should occur because I have, as I discussed, P polarized total internal reflection, right? The transverse component oscillates in this direction. So here I, I, it, it is reflected like this and I should get uh, this strange circular polarization in a plane that contains the fiber axis. So more pictorially, uh, this means that if I now send a horizontally linearly polarized light field into my nanofiber, uh, then the electric field will turn counterclockwise above the fiber and the spin points out of the board, okay? And uh, for symmetry reasons, that also means that the field has to turn clockwise below the fiber. So this also, this already shows you um, that spin is not a good global quantity to describe this light field because it's locally points in one direction above the fiber and into the other direction below the fiber, okay? So what is really conserved here is the total angular momentum, which includes the orbital uh, angular momentum of the light field. And um, so the local ellipticity or spin depends on the transverse position, but more importantly, the local ellipticity uh, flips sign with the direction of propagation for the reasons that we highlighted. So when I now send the light field from the right into this fiber, then it's like the uh, time reversed version of this picture, which also means that the electric field has to circulate the other way around, so clockwise rather than counterclockwise above the fiber. So the, the local ellipticity or spin changes sign with the direction of propagation, and this is this spin momentum locking of light. And knowing this, it should now be um, like more or less straightforward to realize a situation where the transmission of light through the fiber depends on the direction of propagation. All that I would need for that purpose are polarization dependent scatterers. So what I would need is some scatterers which couple, say, to this polarization, the clockwise polarization, and scatter that out of the waveguide, whereas the counterclockwise polarization is uncoupled to the scatterers here and just goes through. And it turns out that spin polarized cesium atoms can be made to do that job. I mean, they can be transformed into polarization dependent scatterers. Um, I should also stress that this principle of operation is exactly the one, so if you work with microwaves, that has been used for decades for realizing uh, optical uh, microwave isolators because in rectangular microwave where waveguides you also have this spin momentum locking of light because of the transverse confinement and what one then does is to put uh, ferrite slabs into the regions where I have circular polarization, I apply a large magnetic field which splits the resonances such that I absorb one circular polarization and leave the other one unaffected. Uh, so this is precisely what we would like to realize now uh, with cesium, in our case, atoms. And um, that can be done by just preparing the cesium atoms in the outermost Zeeman substate of my F equals four ground state manifold. So if I'm in this level here and I now apply a magnetic field as for this microwave isolator, then the Zeeman shift can, for example, tune this level here out of resonance with the sigma minus component, whereas the sigma plus component is in resonance, so it is strongly scattered by the atom, okay? So, um, this can be, can be done, and we, we did that and uh, actually observed, indeed, a strong uh, asymmetry between the forward and backward transmission of light. So here we have about 80% forward transmission and only 13% backward transmission. That corresponds to an isolation of 8 dB. Um, and you may say, well, 8 dB is really a lousy isolator. I buy much better at Torlabs catalog. But remember, those are bulk optical isolators. And it turns out that these values, this combination of high forward transmission and good isolation here was world record at the time when we published this paper. Okay, so where the figure of merit is, dB of isolation per dB of forward loss. Okay, so if you take that as the figure of merit, then that was the best that was there. And actually this job was done by 27 atoms, which were, for reasons of time, I cannot go into the details, uh, trapped 
using fiber guided light fields uh, at a well defined S immutable position in a one dimensional array of trapping minima along uh, the fiber. Now, that is, as I said, completely analogous to a microwave isolator, but interestingly, if you think about it, the a magnetic field which we applied here is not even necessary to realize this asymmetry of transmission. And that is surprising. If I, even if I turn off the magnetic field and this level here shifts into resonance with the sigma minus component, the transition strength of this cycling transition here is still 50 times stronger than the transition strength of this transition. So this is a result of angular momentum algebra and it comes from the klebsch gorin coefficients and 3J and 6J symbols. And it just turns out that for a multi-level atom with a large spin like cesium here, the asymmetry of these two transitions is very large. And this is a sufficient precondition for realizing an isolator, okay? So I just need these to be asymmetric in other words, this external B field that I applied here is not strictly necessary. Neither are the atomic magnetic moments. You could say, yeah, but the atoms are small magnets, okay? But it turns out that you can think about level schemes where the gyromagnetic ratio is just zero and the thing still works, okay? Uh, yes, here's okay, a question. Okay, so usually when we have these uh, non-reciprocal devices, we say, well, um, the, the principle of time reversal symmetry has been broken by the fact that we have a magnetic field and everything's fine. And then here you say, well, we don't need the magnetic field and so this seems weird. So it seems like somewhere there's hidden in this problem something that's uh, getting us out of the time reversal problem. So, Ex so there's nothing that gets us out of the time reversal problem, but this is exactly the the, the, the important question to ask here, what breaks time reversal symmetry? And turns out it's the atomic spin itself. So the atomic spin has the same time reversal symmetry properties as a magnetic field. In other words, if I reverse time, this level becomes this level, okay? And everything is good. So the whole, the whole system so does not violate- the creation of pumping that thing into that state in the first place that broke the symmetry. Exactly, so. using a circularly polarized laser which can be interpreted as a fictitious magnetic right. field. So this is, this is what breaks time reversal symmetry here. Yeah. So it is a spin controlled diet, okay? It's, and, and in a sense, I would claim that in addition to this, so there are, in, there are fights and papers about what is an isolator and what is not, you know? And, and uh, actually there, were, there, there was, formally it was said you need either a temporal modulation of the waveguide that breaks time reversal symmetry, of course, if I have a sound wave propagating along the waveguide, a magnetic field or a nonlinearity. And here, there's a fourth thing that you add. Yes? Just a little detail. So uh, does this require the atoms only on one side of the? Yes. So for a, like a tapered fiber, Yes. how would you do that? So we, we I mean, we know how to do that uh, by actually using the fictitious magnetic fields created by the trapping light fields themselves and some offset field, we can actually have a Zeeman splitting. So actually we can make these atoms, uh, initially we have atoms on both sides of the fiber indeed because we have trapping arrays above and below the fiber. Uh, but then by making use of the fictitious fields of the trapping light fields plus some homogeneous offset field, we can for example have these atoms sitting in a field of three gauss and these in a field of 10 gauss. And then you just hide them using a microwave pulse in the other F manifold, f equals three manifold. So this is something we, is, which can be done in a standard way. And actually you can also devise schemes where it works on both sides uh, if you, because you don't need the magnetic field. So in a sense, you, you can also make the isolator work with atoms on both sides of the fiber if you don't apply a large magnetic field. That was, but you yes. need a magnetic field spin polarized to ML, right? Like you, at the beginning, you turn on a magnetic okay. spin. So, I mean, you cannot imagine, it, 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 is, it was quite funny. We, when we submitted the paper, we never said that it is magnetic field free, okay? Because here indeed for this experiment, we had a magnetic field applied which did shift it out of resonance. I will show you later on uh, experiments where 
uh, we show that by keeping a tiny, so you need a tiny magnetic field to do to stabilize the spin, which can be so small that uh, the level shifts are smaller than the natural line widths of the levels. So you don't shift levels out of resonance. So that already shows you that it shouldn't be the magnetic field that induces the non-reciprocity. And then we showed that by flipping the spin, we change the, propagate, the, the, the direction of operation while keeping the magnetic field in the same direction, okay? But just the, 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 the funny story is that when we submitted the paper, two referees wrote back, you are lying, this is not magnetic field free. <laughs> and then we were like, okay, usually what you do is you say, we thank the referee and we remove the sentence, but we didn't say that, you know? <laughs> and then, and then we, we thought like, okay, so, but then let us just claim, yes, it is magnetic field free, if they say so, <laughs> and fight for it. <laughs> and, and that's what we did. This is what we did, okay. No, I was and, not <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that was a strange situation. I would also like to stress that while this isolator here is based, the operation principle is based on qu in a quantum optical effect, this is not a quantum component. It is a classical isolator. Why do I say that? Because how would you, I mean, if I wanted to prepare this diet in a quantum superposition of passing light from right to left and passing light from left to right, I would have to prepare all 27 atoms in a quantum superposition of all atoms being in this state and all atoms being in this state. And that would be a very large greenberger horn Seilinger state, heavily entangled, very fragile, not practical to prepare in the lab. So that means that these 27 atoms make this whole thing classical, basically, okay? If I had a single atom doing the job, then it would be straightforward to prepare the atom in a quantum superposition of these two spin states with classical microwave fields, a la Paul Jessen, right? I mean, he can do that, prepare a superposition of this level and this level. However, the coupling strength of each of these 27 atoms to the fiber, in our case, is relatively weak. It's only an absorption per atom of a few percent. So that would make some non-reciprocal diet, but it would be a lousy diet, okay? In order to make this into a good diet, we would need to somehow increase the coupling strength of an atom to the waveguide, okay? And this can be done um, by actually mediating this coupling to the waveguide by means of a whispering gallery mode resonator. So now rather than coupling the atom directly to the nanofiber, what we do is to couple the atom to a dielectric structure which is cylindrically symmetric. It's actually like a, you could say it's a sphere or a toroid. In our case, it's a more prolate shaped uh, glass structure which confines light per, by continuous total internal reflection. And now I couple the atom to this light field and I couple then this resonator to my fiber by means of a frustrated internal, total internal reflection. And I can now tune the coupling strength of the fiber to the resonator light field by tuning this coupling gap here. And I can be in a regime where the atom is in the strong coupling regime with respect to the resonator modes and thereby realize an effective resonator enhanced atom, okay? I should stress that the same system is also used by Barak Dayan at the Weizmann Institute of Science for doing wonderful experiments. Uh, in our case now, rather than cesium, we use rubidium 85. And as for cesium, if I now prepare my rubidium 85 in this outermost Zeeman substate here, I can single out like a V-level scheme. I have this closed cycling transition and this, M, this sigma minus transition here. Now if I send light into my resonator through my coupling fiber, the light will uh, here circulate counterclockwise in my resonator. And now the important property of the whispering gallery mode resonator is that it preserves this spin momentum locking of light or that it also features spin momentum locking of light, meaning that when the light goes counterclockwise, locally the field, the electric field, turns in a plane that contains the plane of the screen here and goes sigma plus, so clockwise, uh, when the light goes counterclockwise, okay? 
So that means that if I now probe the resonator with such a light field and I tune the frequency of this light field over the empty resonator resonance, the resonances show up as dips, so this is this gray line here, dips in transmission through my fiber here. And actually you see that the transmission, when I tune the frequency of my light field over the resonance of whispering gallery mode, vanishes at resonance. So this is uh, actually possible by tuning the gap or between the resonator and the fiber to the point where I reach this uh, condition of critical coupling where actually all light is dissipated in the resonator and no light continues on the fiber. So you can, in that case, uh, see the resonator as an impedance match terminator of my optical fiber and it just dumps all the light uh, in the fiber. And now if I couple an atom to this resonator in the regime of strong coupling, this atom will split this resonance here. So the two level atom plus this mode here gives rise to two new normal modes with a splitting which is given by the coupling constant or twice the coupling constant of the atoms to the mode. So you see this red uh, line is the theoretical prediction or the fit, uh, theoretical fit and the blue data are the uh, experimental data points of this transmission with atom present in the, in the, in the uh, resonator mode. Now if I do the same experiment but probe the same system from the other side, however, then the light field rotates clockwise in my resonator and accordingly the electric field turns counterclockwise. So this means that this field probing from here now drives the sigma minus transition. And as for the cesium atom where the imbalance between these two was 1 to 50, here it's 1 to 30. Okay, for rubidium, the spin is slightly smaller, the imbalance is a bit smaller, but it's still uh, 1 to 1 thirtieth, which means that this uh, light field here is so weakly coupled to the atom that the atom basically does not modify the resonator spectrum at all. So with and without atom, we see the same resonance of my resonator. Basically, I see an empty resonator even though the atom is there. Now, this is a very non-reciprocal system because probing one and the same optical system from the left and from the right gives rise to two qualitatively different transmission spectra. Okay? And this actually realizes when you think about, the, when you consider the transmission at resonance, an optical diet. Because when I probe the light, the resonator from the left, so I just send, I don't know what's happening, okay. Yes, uh, when I probe it from the left, the light would strongly couple to the atom, so the atom Rabi splits the resonance, the light cannot enter the resonator, just stays in the fiber, and thus I have high transmission here. When I send the light from the other side, however, then the atom is weakly coupled, the light goes into the resonator, it's critically coupled, meaning that it will just be dissipated in the resonator and I have low transmission. And this realizes then an optical diet and here the isolation was even 13 dB, okay, with a single atom. And the forward transmission was as high as 72% still. So here we control the direction of propagation with a single atom. However, this device is still not a quantum device. Why? Because this diet is dissipative. It is based on losses. Meaning that while it is of obviously possible now to prepare the atom in a quantum superposition of the two spin states, the first photon that would go through this diet would tell me in which spin state the atom is. It collapses the wave function and consecutive photons would not be treated equally, okay? In order to turn this into a true quantum component, we would need to get rid of the dissipation here. And this is possible. We just have to make sure that the light is not dissipated in the resonator, but rather coupled out of the resonator again by a second coupling fiber. So here we approach a second fiber, which you could call drop fiber here, to the resonator in such a way that the light field, when it couples into the resonator, doesn't uh, dissipate, but couples out into 
the port, uh, another port of this drop fiber here, okay? So more in detail, I uh, now have four ports, and this fiber here is like the initial fiber that I had, and I have this one to two diode, but when I send light from port two, the atom is weakly coupled, the light goes into the resonator, but before being dissipated, it couples out to port three. If I send light into port three, the atom is strongly coupled and uh, cannot enter the resonator and comes out of port four. If I send light into port four, the atom is weakly coupled, the light goes into the resonator and comes out of port one. So port one to two to three to four to one is the principle of operation of an optical circulator, yes. Um, so originally, So here, no energy is dissipated. This, in principle, in the previous thing, it's the internal losses of the cavity here. So it's actually the loss of the combined atom resonator system. The resonator itself has a finite Q factor because of scattering and absorption in the material, okay? And then, in addition, I have an atom which is coupled to it, which can also decay by spontaneous emission into free space. So this gives rise to a combined dissipation rate of the system, and that is what dissipates the light. So the light is either transformed into heat of the resonator material or scattered out of the atom resonator system into free space. So here you're saying that by putting another fiber before they dissipate, you're, it will be coupled to Exactly. So I, I now put another fiber in such a way that before the light is dissipated, it couples out into the other fiber. So in principle, this can now become a unitary operation, right, where I don't have dissipation. Okay, so um, the, the parameters that I can vary for this circulator now uh, is basically the coupling strength of the fibers to the resonator because you can picture this resonator plus the drop fiber as being a worse resonator. It, I, I introduce losses to this resonator, I reduce the Q factor of the resonator, and then I can again approach this fiber a bit more to again reach critical coupling. But So the question is what is the optimal distance of the fibers from the resonator? And if I uh, now uh, uh, measure the transmission forwards and backwards of these four diodes here. I have like the one to two, to two to three, the three to four, and the four to one diode. If I measure the forward and backward transmission as a function of the coupling strengths of the fiber, then I see some behavior where actually I get, uh, without annoying you with all the data, I get a sweet spot here um, for uh, this value of coupling strengths in relative units. Uh, where I do have high forward transmission and low backward transmission for all four diodes. If I convert these transmission values into isolations, then I have about 5 dB of isolation at least for all four diodes, and the best one is, is uh, like 10 dB here. And interestingly, the photon survival probability is still very high here. Okay, so I have uh, still a uh, 70% probability for a photon that I send into the circulator to come out of the circulator again, okay? So I think I should not go so much into the details, so just take my word for it that now what we did here in this experiment was, first of all, there was a small, because there was this question, there was a small magnetic field applied to stabilize the spin state of the atom, but it was so small that the Zeeman shifts were much smaller than the line widths of the excited state of the atom resonator system, and to prove that it's really not the magnetic field that uh, induces the non-reciprocity here, what we did was to prepare the atom in the opposite spin state and showed that then the routing was not one to two to three to four to one, but one to four to three to two to one, okay? So uh, that means that by uh, flipping the spin of uh, the atom, we can actually uh, realize a kind of roundabout for light that switches from uh, the US to the UK, <laughs> okay? And um, maybe uh, the last thing that I should, yes? Both, yes? Is there some sort of fundamental principle with how many ports you can have? What, what, what happens if you start putting more fibers around it? Okay, that, that we, we thought about that, and there actually by 
you, you can, in principle, uh, go, go to a higher number of ports and, and still make resonators. But you can, uh, can you still have it be uh, completely 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5 to 6 to 1? Or was I think that we had a scheme like that. And I would have to sit down and scratch my head how that was. But we had that question it's in our minds. And yes, it's, it's possible. Which fiber to exit on, if Sorry? It's not clear to me how we decide which fiber to exit yeah, on. Yeah, it's a, it's a network of, of, of uh, I mean, you, 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 you need more than one one circulator to, to realize that. I will say a few things about networks of circulators later, maybe then when you see a, a bit of the idea, yeah. Um, do you ever see something like the initial, so you prepare it in this sort of very low entropy state, do you ever see the, like the initial Riemann level sort of over, over time if you run it sort of become mixed Abs and then yes. Yes, so this is a very important question. So I should stress that the operation we demonstrate here is uh, actually pulsed in the sense that we prepare the atom, but the atom is free falling anyway, so it's only coupled for, in that experiment, it's not trapped for the whispering gallery mode resonator. And, but we showed that in, you, you will actually, if you, if you send the light uh, into the resonator from the wrong side, so into the blocking direction for a long time, you will depump the atom. So if you wanted to transform this into a CW operating uh, isolator or circulator, it would be possible, no problem. You just have to permanently repump the atom on the D1 line, for example. So you use another light field that then, you know, pumps the atom back to the right spin state. Um, but uh, the, the, actually the, the important uh, part or the, the, the important feature of this resonator is not, uh, of this circulator is not so much that it can handle a lot of photons where you would eventually depump the atom, but it is able to handle single photons. Because as I said, the, one of the other ways of realizing isolators would be nonlinearities, where you can have low losses, in principle forward losses, but then you need high powers, okay? And you would want a linear uh, device because then it can handle single photons as well. So. Oh, and, and this is, that already brings me to the last part of my, my talk, which is now about the, the uh, nonlinear behavior of this, this circulator. Because what I showed you so far were the linear, was the linear response of the, of the circulator. Uh, and my apologies to the theorists when I just write down a cat one for a, vote for a single photon, I will say what I mean and what we measure immediately. But the idea is if photons arrive one by one on the circulator, then they behave as I just lined out. So meaning I send a single photon and the atom is strongly coupled to the light field here. The light field cannot enter the resonator, so the photon just comes out of port one. If, however, two photons arrive simultaneously at the resonator, and simultaneously means within the lifetime of the excited atom resonator system, then the, uh, this will like saturate the atom because the atom cannot scatter two photons at a time, enter the resonator and come out of port four here. And now what did we measure? Uh, we sent a weak laser light field into port one here and then check the intensity autocorrelation function at this output port and this output port. And indeed, on port two, we see a pronounced anti-bunching of the light field. This is because we filter away the two photon component partially, and it comes out of this port, meaning that on the port four here, we see a pronounced bunching, okay? So here we have a photon number routing uh, capability, okay? So, uh, maybe you heard about this being useless, okay? There is a paper by Jeff Shapiro saying giant kernel nonlinearity does not help quantum computation. And it's true that with this nonlinearity that I demonstrated here, you cannot directly build a quantum gate. However, it can still be useful. So there is a nice paper by Anders Sörensen and Michel Lukin where they show that you can actually build um, uh, error-proof Bell state analyzers using such photon sorters here. So you can actually with, uh, not with unity efficiency, but without error probability distinguish Bell states. And that is still useful. And it can be concatenated and make approach unity efficiency. So I think it's still a useful device. Uh, sorry. So with this, I come to the summary of the talk. I presented these guided modes and optical uh, nanofibers to you and showed you that the local polarization 
it's actually directly linked to the propagation direction. And then I showed you the realization of two non-reciprocal components, which can be considered as nanoscale quantum optical analogs of microwave components that were known, okay? Um, uh, however, here in this case, it is really has the potential of op being operated as a quantum, uh, quantum device where, for example, I could realize the Schrödinger cat state of light where a pulse comes out here and here depending on the eternal state of the atom and, and so on. So where, where can all this lead to? First of all, uh, obviously I showed you some rudimentary optical signal processing and, and routing of light in integrated optical environments and this is not trivial. Uh, this integrated optical environments, and also at the level of single photons, so meaning that you can handle quantum information. I think all this shows you that we should actually revisit the one-dimensional atom model. So uh, the one-dimensional atom model is a term that was coined by Jeff Kimball, and uh, it actually refers to the simplest possible model of light matter interaction, a single two-level atom coupled to a single propagating uh, field mode or a pair of counter-propagating field modes because all the truths and all the, let's say, dogmas that you know about this one-dimensional atom model are based on the assumption of symmetric coupling to these two field modes, okay? And here you saw that it's possible to switch off the coupling to one of the counter-propagating modes and exclusively couple to the rightwards propagating mode, for example, and that gives qualitatively new effects. Just to say that, for example, um, collective effects like sub and super radians do not exist in that case because you, that assumes also symmetric uh, coupling. Um, and then, I, since I'm, I already mentioned that this nonlinearity here allows us to realize photon sorters and then QND detectors and error proof bell state analyzers in principle. And uh, to uh, please uh, Mohamed, uh, I would also say let's consider now networks of quantum uh, circulators. What can they do? Actually, when you consider now um, many of these whispering gathering mode resonators, which are operated as four port devices and connected in such a way where these loose ends here are supposed to have mirrors, okay? So the light will just uh, bounce back when it uh, uh, arrives here. Then uh, you actually see that uh, if I launch light into this structure uh, in, in that sense, okay, so clockwise, then no matter where I launch it, it cannot propagate, it will be trapped in such a loop. So it's a kind of bulk isolator, okay, no matter uh, which of the loops I, I consider, the light will stay like that. But if I launch the light the other way around, then I get some kind of edge channel where the light then can uh, go, go around the edge. Is that good for something? I leave that to Mohamed to, to, to think about it. And uh, finally, uh, it's also uh, when you consider now the coupling of such two-level emitters, the chiral coupling of such two-level emitters, collectively to such a mode, then interesting things happen uh, because there is a very strange dipole-dipole interaction now happening. The standard dipole-dipole interaction in free space is symmetric in the sense that whatever this dipole does to this one will be also coming back. But here I have a situation where this emitter, for example, only emits to the right. This emitter can only absorb from the left, but then only absorb to the right. So this emitter never knows whether there are other emitters downstream. And if you just dissipatively pump, I mean, if you pump this system from the side and let the atoms decay, uh, I mean, emit into this waveguide here, then you end up with an entangled state of, which is like a, uh, where, where pairs of atoms will be in a bell state and separated. So this fluorescence here switches off, and I have again two entangled atoms and so on. So this is, shows you that you can also get interesting quantum many-body physics, uh, new phases of light and matter, which maybe are useful for quantum simulation. And if you find all this interesting, then you can also check a review that we recently wrote on chiral quantum optics with uh, the groups of Peter Lodal and Peter Zola in Nature. And with this, I would like to thank my uh, co-workers who did the experiments. I would like to thank the funding agencies. And last but not least, I would like to take the time for some shameless ad. So uh, I actually uh, accepted recently an uh, offer from Humboldt University in Berlin. And 
uh, we will have access also to new uh, like uh, nano fabrication facilities. Um, so there are new opportunities and also uh, PhD and postdoc positions available. And with this, I uh, would like to thank you for your attention.